Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for panel nine, Reclamation Through Data-Informed Methods for Studying Slavery and Beyond. Uh, I'm Christina. Figure that out. Something's wrong. Loudly, right? Uh, I'm Christina Poznan. I'm the PH, uh, the um, managing editor of the Journal of Slavery and Data Preservation at Enslaved Peoples of the Historical Slave Trade, also known as enslaved.org. Um, we are delighted to have today with us um, panelists who were all participants in enslaved.org sponsored programs, um, an NEH Summer Institute for College and University faculty, as well as several iterations of the Big Ten Academic Alliance's uh, Summer Research Opportunity Program um, for mentored student research. Um, today we will have uh, four presentations um, made by the five wonderful um, scholars that we have with us today. We'll start with Jasma Sutton, who's an assistant professor of history at the Miami University of Ohio and earned her PhD from the University of Indiana. Her research focuses on the histories of slavery and freedom in the US with a particular interest on African-American women's, women's history of the Midwest. Grace Murray is a PhD student at Cornell University in the Department of Literatures in English. She graduated in May of 2023 from Loyola University of Maryland with a degree in English and a minor in African and African-American studies. Her research interests include African-American literature, disability studies, media studies, and labor studies. Camelia Bell is a recent graduate of Norfolk State University um, with a bachelor's degree in history. Her academic research interests include African diaspora history, Black Maronage, contemporary queer theory, and women's and gender studies. She's worked at the Smithsonian, the Robert Center at Norfolk State University, and the Seoul Down River Project. Victoriana Mejia and Jaden Evans are public history majors at St. Mary's University in San Antonio, Texas. Victoriana is a McNair scholar and a participant in Enslaved.org's um, program in 2022. Her research has primarily focused on mistreatment, injustices, and religious influence to suppress enslaved people before, during, and after the Civil War, currently focusing on Black Texas history um, and Black San Antonio. Um, Jaden Evans is looking forward to contributing to an organization committed to helping the public discover the hidden histories of their communities. Please join me in welcoming our panelists. We'll begin with Jasmine. Can you all hear me? Can you? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. In her 2016 article, The Politics of the Archive and History's Accountability to the Enslaved, Stephanie Smallwood asks, how might we write histories that are accountable to the enslaved, and as I like to add, to the enslaved and their descendants? I've been reflecting on this question a lot over the past few years, and I hope my presentation offers one approach to answering that question. The first half of my talk will introduce you to my larger work, which began as my 2022 dissertation and is now the topic of my current book manuscript. The remainder of my presentation will focus on a data set I created last summer as a participant in the enslaved.org Data Informed Methods and Slavery Studies, NEH Institute. The data set is still a work in progress. And so if you have any suggestions or questions, I'm happy to talk about that during Q and A. My current book manuscript, Moving Toward Freedom, 
Black Women, Slavery, and Freedom in Antebellum, Indiana, is the first to chronicle the lives of Black women, free, enslaved, or self-liberated, who chose or were forced to leave the South and try their hand at freedom in the Midwest. At the center of my work is a study of the Greenville Settlement, founded in 1818 by, formerly enslaved, by, by a formerly enslaved couple named James and Sophia Clemens on the border of Randolph County, Indiana, and Dark County, Ohio. Understanding well the paradoxes and possibilities of freedom in Indiana, Black women develop survival strat strategies that help them to articulate their own ideas of freedom. Their collective actions, initiating freedom suits, creating free Black homes, liberating themselves and their loved ones, establishing religious and educational institutions, and keeping ancestral traditions provide a unique window into the complex history of slavery and freedom in Indiana. Reimagining archival silences through descendant historical knowledge, my work affirms that Black women in the antebellum Midwest have not been erased, forgotten, or silenced. They have instead been preserved in plain sight. As a graduate student at Indiana University Bloomington, it did not take me long to realize I would not be able to write a traditional history of Black women in the antebellum Midwest. Alta Jett, a Black woman living in Richmond, Indiana in the 1980s, aptly described the issue of Midwestern archives and traditional approaches to them. She said, quote, if you want the history of a white man, you go to the library. If you want the history of Black women, you go to the attics, the closets, and the basements. Yes, Scholars have long known that records housed in predominantly white institutions obscure the lives of enslaved Black women and their descendants more than they reveal. As a consequence, Black women have historically chosen to keep records of their lives within their homes. When I started to look beyond the archive or the official record, I discovered the Greenville descendant community disrupting cycles of archival oppression with technology. The community's Facebook page, Remembering Freedom, preserved over 1,000 photos of historical documents in 13 years of, in 13 years of posts creating a gateway to broader discovery. Through the Greenville Descendant Community, I learned that individual members have compiled, written, and published family histories for over a century, a pattern repeated by many other descendants throughout the Midwest. A descendant collective aided my research, generously sharing records and oral histories and sending the research findings they found visiting local libraries by mail. Our relationship proved to be mutually beneficial as I shared my resources, which contextualized their own work. Convinced that there was more to learn about the Greenville women and that their descendants were the key to unlocking that knowledge, I participated in the community's annual homecoming at the Bethel Wesleyan Church in Greenville, Ohio in 2019. In advance, I organized with the permission of the descendant community a history harvest. My goal was threefold. One, recover historical evidence of Black women's lives outside of mainstream archives. Two, create a more complete and diverse understanding of Indiana history. And three, contribute to the digital toolbox descendant communities use to share and teach their histories. The Remembering, His the Remembering Freedom History Harvest was a jointly developed project between the Greenville Descendant Community and a group of researchers and student volunteers from Indiana University. Like other history harvests, the Greenville community came together with university partners to share and contribute their stories, photographs, and artifacts in an open source digital archive. 12 members of the community participated in the harvest and contributed hundreds of individual items. For some, it is unfathomable to think that, as Jessica Marie Johnson writes, quote, black subjects have themselves taken up science, data, and coding. In other words, have commodified themselves and digitized and mediated their own Black freedom dreams in order to hack their way into the system. Modernity, science, the West take root and live where they were never meant to survive. And similarly, Robin D.G. Kelly argues to speak of the archive almost exclusively as an imperial space of unremitting violence is to deny the fact that there have always been alternative archives, oppositional movements, that keep their records, oral histories, and the like. 
I am a traditionally trained historian who turned to digital humanities and critical archival studies when scholars and archivists alike told me it was impossible to write a substantial history of Black women in the antebellum Midwest. My introduction to DH and a deafening archival silence around Black women's lives led me to a, research, to a new research methodology I have termed descendant archival practice. A mixed method approach, BAP involves the identification, preservation, and dissemination of oral histories, historical documents, and material artifacts treasured within descendant communities. Descendant archival practice recognizes Black women memory keepers as experts and authorities of their family's histories, validating their knowledge and practices for use within the historical discipline. Taking Ashley Farmer's call for scholars to do more with less, DAP suggests that less is actually more when we prioritize or even accept Black archives as legitimate sources of knowledge. I agree with archivist Dorothy Berry's assertion that Black archives are whatever Black people want them to be. In employing such a far-reaching definition, she demonstrates that, quote, Black archives are signifying of a desire to be remembered in the face of violent erasure, a right to control one's own narrative from the past to future, a rebellion against the story being told wrong, a conflict with institutional control, anger at structural racism, joy at community understanding, relief at seeing yourself in the past and the future, understanding the power of history, honoring ancestors and elders, imagination in spite of circumstances, hundreds of thousands of individual experiences. To make sense of the items Black women preserved in their home-based archives, I critically read them alongside interviews of formerly enslaved people, biographical sketches of white pioneer women, and other written documents related to Black women. Upon completion, I created a list of keywords that could uncover traces of Black women in other records. For example, in returning to the WPA narratives and county history, searching, it, searching for terms like trunk, Bible, mirror, brush, spoon, bed, jury, window, book, basket, and quilt, provided additional insights to Black women's approach to homemaking, a radical strategy of survival within a system that sought to deny their womanhood. What I learned from this data was that with limited sources, with limited resources, Black women use quotidian household objects to preserve their ancestral history. In the case of Bibles, for instance, free and enslaved Black women were conscious of the fact that these items contain critical information that public records fail to document. Enslaved, family do enslaved families use Bibles to note down genealogical information and marriage records. Oftentimes, these Bibles were the only proof enslaved people had of their birthdays and other significant dates. When an individual could not read or write, they relied on the dates their enslavers wrote for them in family Bibles. Charity Riddick, an illiterate formerly enslaved woman, believed her family Bible, quote, could tell the story of her life better than she could, end quote. Providing further evidence of the significance of family Bibles, the newly emancipated Emily Moore stated, quote, I ain't got nothing in no family Bible. Where'd I get a family Bible? My mammy, with a chuckle, had too many children to look after to be putting them down in a, in a Bible. She didn't have no reading know-how. To me, the sending kept family Bibles suggest that 19th century Black women made conscious efforts about how they wanted to be remembered. Their descendants continue these memory-keeping traditions in the form of digitized family histories and trees, online self-publishing, and genealogical websites like Ancestry and Family Search. I like to focus the rest of my talk on a data set I've been working on to document the rise of slavery in Indiana Territory. My initial, my initial interest in data-informed studies of slavery began with dissertation revisions for my current book manuscript. While my 2022 dissertation focused on the experiences of free Black women, last summer I started working on a new chapter that outlines the rise of slavery in Indiana Territory. To do so, I consulted the 1805 to 1805 Knox County, Indiana Slave Registry, which will later become the focus of my enslaved.org dataset. While conducting preliminary research, 
Knox County stood out to me for several reasons. One, it's the oldest county in Indiana. Two, it has the largest population of slaveholders and enslaved people at the time of Indiana statehood, which was in 1816. And three, Knox County was the home of two black women whose Supreme Court cases set legal precedents for the end of slavery and involuntary servitude in Indiana. Taking all of this into consideration, I hope the data set will help support two critical arguments of my larger work. The first is simple, yet the most important, and that is that slavery existed in Indiana and in the Midwest in general. It not only existed, but shaped the experiences of all Black people throughout the state during the antebellum period. This argument is in direct opposition to those posed by scholars of white pioneer women who assert that limited sources and small population numbers have made it practically impossible for historians to write about Black women's experiences in the Old Northwest or on the frontier. Secondly, secondly, very little has been written about slavery in Indiana and even less about the experiences of the enslaved. Existing literature primarily consists of a couple of outdated books published in the early 20th century, which argue that slavery in Indiana was somehow milder or, or less exploitative or brutal than in the South. Consequently, much of the scholarship focuses on white legislators and anti-slavery debates among territorial leaders at the expense of any in-depth study of the enslaved experience. The title of my data set, There Shall Never there shall be neither slavery nor involuntary servitude is taken verbatim from the slavery ban implemented in the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, while the data set itself reveals the limitations that, of that Congressional Act. Slavery was prohibited, yet white government officials and slaveholders continued purchasing enslaved people and importing them into the region. I do not claim to be the first scholar to analyze the slave registry. However, I am the first to use it to create a data set to be shared with a broader public. In doing so, I hope in turn, this information would allow descendant communities to discover their family history and extend their gene genealogical work. By simply naming these enslaved pioneers, I aim to move our understanding of their lives beyond the fate that they have been subjected to in the historical record, that of being solely property. Who were these individuals? How did they understand their new status as indentured servants? What actions did they take to challenge the limits of their own freedom? How did they create and navigate life and freedom? By saying their names and situating these individuals outside of the context of a written document housing a predominantly white institution, we open up the opportunity to study their lives on their own terms, rather than referencing them solely through their relationship with their enslavers. In order to understand the source at the center of this data set, you have to understand the law that led to its creation. The Knox County Slave Registry was implemented alongside the 1805 Act concerning the introduction of Negroes and mulattoes into the Indiana Territory. The Act allowed slaveholders to bring enslaved people into the territory and convert them into indentured servants. Enslaved individuals over the age of 15 were bound to whatever term of years their owner decided and those under 15 were required to be registered and serve until the age of 35 for males and 32 for females. The owners then had 30 days after their arrival to register enslaved persons with the county clerk. If the enslaved individual refused those terms, the enslaver had 60 days to remove him or her from the territory, presumably to a slave state to be sold. The children of those indentured women could be held until the age of 30 for males and 28 for females. What is significant to note here is that as it was understood during the period and evidenced in various, in various territorial records, the term indentured servant was oftentimes used interchangeably with slave. So much so, a trove of freedom petitions to the same court exists filed by unfree Black people challenging the terms of these contracts. I began my data set with the Knox County Public Library's transcription of the original document. While their, while their transcription is not perfect, it showed me what else was important to include. 
So in addition to the categories laid out by the Knox County Public Library, which I've highlighted in red on the screen, my data set is organized into the following fields that you see on the screen. Currently, the data set documents 51 enslaved individuals and, 20, and 27 enslavers who relocated from the South to Indiana Territory between 1805 and 1807. I hope the data set will reveal something interesting regarding gender, but the numbers of males and females recorded in the registry were within the same range, 28 women, 23 men. Most of these individuals came from Kentucky, followed respectively by South Carolina, Tennessee, and Georgia, accounting for one woman. While few enslaved people were able to secure relatively short indentures, four received terms of 90 to 99 years. The 99-year terms were given to a 16-year-old boy, a 16-year-old girl, and a 30-year-old woman. The shortest term was 10 years for a 15-year-old girl. Over a decade later, the young boy with the 99-year term, Jacob Hawkins, successfully petitioned the court for his freedom. The youngest individual was a two-year-old boy indentured with his mother, and the oldest, a 60-year-old woman, serving a 20-year term, so in other words, a life term. The fact that children were only indentured with their mothers suggests that I will need to analyze how the additional responsibility of motherhood might have impacted enslaved women's gendered experiences of slavery and freedom. So what's next? My plan, my plan is to extend the data set to include other records containing the names of enslaved and unfree individuals in Knox County. The Knox County Public Library is currently undertaking a Black History digitization project and has made court records up until 1818 available online. Now that I have identified the names of these enslaved individuals, I would eventually like to trace their lives beyond slavery and into freedom. Some of their names appear in the last wills and testaments of early white settlers over a decade later. Additionally, one historian has successfully traced the life of the first boy recorded in the slave registry, Jacob Hawkins, and his sister, Anne, who was second on the list. And with descendant archival practices and data-informed methods, I remain hopeful that we can do the same for others. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah. Um, uh, my name is Grace Murray, and I was a part of the 2022 Enslaved.org Straff cohort. Uh, so myself and six other people gave a presentation at the end of our project that we titled Restoring Humanity, Enslaved People Hired Out from the Crampton Estate. And for our research, we were given a document from the Crampton Estate, which it was housed at the Riversdale House in Riverdale Park, Maryland. So the main questions that guided our engagement with the document were, what can we learn about hiring out of enslaved people? How does the information about the hirers help us to understand the lives of enslaved people in Maryland specifically? What narratives can be formed about the lives of enslaved people for hire from the limited amount of evidence that is available and recorded about them? And how can the language and interpretation of the transcription in our research be used in a way to bring humanity back to those who were enslaved? So, although our ultimate goal was to decenter the enslavers, we did need to begin our investigation into the lives of the enslaved by looking at those who enslaved them. Um, so Thomas Crampton was an enslaver, judge, legislator, and landowner. 
and we estimate that the document was written sometime between 1831 and 1837, after Crampin's death in 1830. Crampin's wife, Caroline, was the daughter of George Calvert and an enslaved woman named Eleanor Beckett. And after Crampin's death, Caroline's half-brother, Charles Benedict, took over Crampin's estate. Charles Benedict was one of the founders of what would become the University of Maryland. So this document, um, which is pictured here, lists 32 enslaved individuals that had been hired out, who and where they had been hired out to, and the compensation for their labor. And as you can see, um, this we had to transcribe this. Um, yeah, so we spent a, the first couple of sessions learning some paleography or transcription skills. And then we each transcribed the document individually. After that, we came together to work through the document as a group and discuss any variants in um, individual transcriptions. So once we had agreed upon a final transcription, um, we created a historical data set from that and we labeled our columns as follows. Uh, here is the, the data set that we made. Um, list order, list of identifiers, names of enslaved, perceived sex, formatting anomalies, street, city slash county, hired to, payments to Crampin's estate, event type, and document type. List order was simply assigned based on the order that they showed up in the document, so that was imputed. Um, our identifiers are codes that were assigned to each enslaved person for identification in the larger enslaved.org da database, and that was also imputed. The names of the enslaved were transcribed from the document, and we based perceived sex off of the sex that was typically associated with an individual's name. And we wanted to note the use of the language of perceived because sex played a large role in the lives of enslaved people. Mm -hmm. um, as Jasna said, um, enslavement was a gendered experience. So. Formatting anomalies were any attributes or any extra characters that made that data entry unique. And this was a transcribed category, and that also gave us some room for speculation. And we titled the column Payments to Crampin's Estate as such because we wanted to highlight that the enslaved individuals would not be the ones to enjoy the fruits of their labor. So as an example of some of the analysis that was involved with our interpretation of the data, Here's a section of the Crampin document that we flagged because of the special notations. Um, Isaac and Benedict listed here both have an X in pencil next to their names. And we're not sure exactly what that X meant, but um, it likely meant that they had some type of significance to the Crampin estate, be that positive or negative. And the last two lines there, um, you can barely see it. Um, Emmeline is listed there um, and then Charles. And those were both written much fainter than the other lines in the document. Those were written in pencil rather than ink. And that indicates that they were written at a later date than the rest of the ledger. Um, and we also did a lot of work researching enslavement in Maryland during this time, which led us to Isaac Franklin and John Armfield, notorious traders of enslaved people of this era. As tobacco, which was a major export of Maryland and Virginia, became a less lucrative crop, many enslaved people were hired out to work in urban areas like the people from our document, and many more enslaved people were also sold to the Deep South. Yeah. Franklin and Armfield transported around 10,000 enslaved people from the DMV area to be sold in Mississippi and Louisiana. So when searching um, the Crampin and, or when searching the Franklin and Armfield documents, and data sets for names, we did find two Emma lines on those. Um, and you can see here, um, so our document also had two Emma lines. And the spreadsheet, the Franklin and Armfield spreadsheet lists their ages and how much that they were sold for. And if you recall, the second Emma line's name was written entirely in pencil. And then if we go back to the original document, um, here we can see that there is a word in the margins in pencil that looks like Armfield, and that bracket-like mark also 
um, possibly implicates Davey, who's listed below Emmeline, um, who we can presume might have been sold by Franklin and Armfield as well. So we also cross-referenced cross our list with the Calvert account book data set that the 2021 cohort created and found eight names that matched. Jacob, Mary, Lucinda, Delilah, Eli, Christy, Henry, and Emmeline. And this account book is estimated to have been written between 1831 and 1864, which aligns with our estimation of when the Crampton list was written. We also made use of census records from the early um, decades of the 19th century and the Washington City Directory from 1834 to find people who were hired out or who hired out the enslaved individuals. Once we located an enslaver in Washington City, we were able to speculate about how the life of that enslaved individual might have been different than an, an enslaved individual who was hired out in a rural area of Montgomery County, for example. So among other sources, we use the narrative of Frederick Douglass as an authority for enslavement in both rural and urban Maryland in the early 19th century. And as a visual tool, we used 19th century um, maps from the Library of Congress and the Maryland State Archives to locate some of the enslavers. We found four enslavers that hired out five of the people on our list. Uh, this map, for, for instance, depicts a series <laughs> or a section of Montgomery County from 1865. So even that's, though that's a little later than our document, um, we did um, note a Mrs. S. L. Knott who we presume to be the widow of Stanislaus Knott, who hired out Isaac. And since the document itself did not contain a vast amount of data regarding the identities of the enslaved individuals, um, our work involved a lot of speculation. And although speculation might not have a lot of tangible results, using the little evidence that we had to hypothesize and construct a vision of the what their lives may have been like by um, and addressing them by name, attempting to decenter the lie or their their enslavers. That is all a part of the work of restoring humanity to people who were denied that humanity during their lifetimes. Um, enslaved individuals are far too often thought of as nameless and faceless, um, existing in the lives of society at large, more so as a mass than as a particular. And uh, when researching the history of enslavement in Maryland, we also focused on the systemic consequences of enslavement in the present day. We met with local historians, Maxine Gross and Violetta Sharp Jones to learn about how the University of Maryland, an institution founded with money from the sale of enslaved individuals um, mm -hmm. on our document, has damaged their neighboring community of Lakeland. So as you may know, much of Maryland is swamp and marshland. Um, housing in Lakeland, a predominantly African-American community was damaged over the years by flooding. And in 1961, a significant number of those houses did not meet modern housing standards. So the city of College Park requested the federal government's help and the Lakeland Urban Renewal Project ensued, during which many family homes were destroyed and around 104 families were displaced. Um, these family homes were replaced with townhouses, high density apartments that a lot of UMD students live in, and an elder housing facility. So as a result, many of those families that had lived in Lakeland for generations were not able to resettle there. And Maxine Gross and Violetta Sharps Jones are currently engaged in a struggle for restorative justice for their community. Mm -hmm. And their campaign should not be separated from what we learned in our research on the Crampins and the Calverts as the descendants of the people on our list and in the Calvert account book are likely settled in the area after emancipation. Uh, so the consequences of chattel enslavement as an institution affects individuals, families, and communities today. Our research combats the erasure of enslaved individuals as individuals and can help in the fight for reparations for descendants of enslaved Africans and current African-American communities. By naming and acknowledging these people who have been unnamed and ignored for so long, space is opened up to bring them and their descendants justice. As more research is done, we hope that our data set and identifiers prove useful to those attempting to trace their family history as well. This research, this research is not a stopping point. It has deep meaning for us in our present and will help to shape our future. Thank you.
Good afternoon. Oh, there we go. Hi, um, my name is Camelia Charmel Bell. I use they, she pronouns. Um, and I'm one of the six participants of the 2023 SROP and slave.org summer research cohort. And I am very happy to be here with you today. Um, I don't have a lot of time. So if I speak really quickly, please forgive me. But if you have any questions at the end, happy to answer. Um, and today I will be presenting the final product of our program entitled uh, From Personhood, uh, From Paper to Personhood, Enslaved, Free, and Disabled Black Experiences from an Enslaver's Daybook, Georgetown, D.C., 1796 to 1799. Now to get you thinking about the broader implications of our work, um, here are some questions for you to read and to ponder as you move through our presentation. Um, now, we conduct this research because currently there remains a reluctance to center Black voices within intersectional contexts and an ongoing international effort to erase expansive, marginalized identities. And by presenting our digital presentation, um, our digital collection process, and offering accessibility to our data-informed research, we welcome the public to recognize the importance of reparative work and to utilize it for their developmental advantage. Now, geographically, we focused on enslavement in D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. Um, specifically, 18th century to early 19th century, D.C., Maryland, and Virginia were very close-knit slave societies, uh, which means that they perpetuated chattel slavery as a means to sustain the production of wealth, racial hierarchies, and legal justification, while ensuring escape and rebellion be violently subjugated. Uh, however, as history has showed us, enslaved families and communities remained vigilant in their uh, resistance and their assertion as human beings. The location in which our research uh, originated is situated in Georgetown um, before it was made a district of Washington, D.C. in 1871 with their Consolidation Act. Um, specifically, the place we acquired our primary document from is called Tudor Place. It was built in 1794, um, and it surrounds modern-day 31st and Q Street, if you're familiar. Um, it is a tract of land. It was a home, and it continues to be a space victimized by colonization as well as slavery. Now, to provide some familial context in terms of the enslavers our research is based on, um, the enslavers of focus are named the Peter family. Uh, this is a family tree that hosts uh, a litany of familial connections from enslavers, including the Washingtons, to the enslaved. Um, Circled on the screen there in the red is uh, Martha Custis Peter and her husband, Thomas Peter, who were the family who bought the property within Georgetown in 1805. Uh, we know that the Custis Peter uh, Washington trifecta established multiple sites, including Arlington House, um, Mount Vernon, some land in Seneca, Maryland, as well as sites named Effingham and Oakland. And it's likely that the enslaved families mentioned in this family tree were held in and around these areas. Now, although there is the addition of the enslaved Black families in this tree, since there is, since these enslaving families um, maintain their wealth and their status through the continuous trafficking and dehumanization of Black families, tragically, there remains a lot of gaps in the histories of their lives and the experiences um, that they suffered through from birth to death. And we aim to help restore them. Uh, please be advised, um, much of the material history and language that you're going to be seeing uh, surrounding these details in this document are going to be really challenging to engage with. So um, please note. Now, as stated, uh, we acquired the document from uh, archivists and historians over at Tudor Place, and the primary source itself is called the Thomas Peter Account Book. The state of the book itself was in excellent condition. Um, it's believed to have been used as a record keeping of the family's transactions and possessions, including the black families that they kept enslaved. Um, it was small enough to assume that it may have been on the enslaver's persons at all times, and it could also be used on both sides. Um, now we concluded that the daybook had multiple authors, uh, including Armistead Peter III, who was the last of the six generations of the enslaver Peter family, and Thomas Peter himself. Um, this inscription is detailing the upcoming list of the Black families who were forced into bondage by Martha Custis's father, John Custis. Um, and since he died into state, which means without a will, um, it left her grandmother, Martha Washington, a dower. Um, and we assume the enslaved Black families detailed were partly from her, 
from the patrimony list and from the DAWR. Now the daybook itself contains three sections, um, a patrimony list, a record of sales, and a record of hiring. Um, that part I won't have much time to talk about today, but I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Um, now it's significant to note that the very first thing listed in the family's accounting is the list of enslaved people. And that speaks a lot to how um, black exploitation was the backbone of how society perceived value at this time, um, and especially now in contemporary times. Um, yet there is importance to the fact that they were also named alongside Barnabas. Um, if you can see a little closely in that second image, a little down. Um, now from top to bottom, the individuals were labeled in name, sometimes last name, but mostly first, um, age and valuation. There were a few notable people that were not assigned an age or a valuation and instead were labeled as invalid and insane. Um, now the red line there on the screen indicates our assumption um, that based on how the information was listed, there were possibly family units within these pages. This next session is detailing the transactions of enslaved Black communities and families that were sold between their previous and their later enslavers. Uh, the pages include the date of the transactions, the listed names, the number of people sold in their individual and collective valuations in um, pounds, shillings, and pence. Uh, now, as seen, we know that some enslaved Black families were sold with one another, such as Betty, Annie, and Mike, um, if you can see a little closely in that. Uh, top section there. Um, however, others were separated through their reselling. Now, tragically, the missing piece of this section is where these families went to and to whom. Um, though general uh, areas were mentioned, like Eastern Shore and Georgetown, um, it's difficult to conclude where exactly these individuals were being forced to, to be after this moment in time. Uh, now, this page uh, begins with the date um, and place following with the label Brickyard, and then it goes on to list transactions in different formats of uh, two person, the labor done, sometimes the duration, and then varied amounts paid in pounds, shillings, and pence. Um, now, specifically, this is illustrating the transactions of labor uh, between free Black individuals and the enslaver Peter family. Um, and it's a very clear indication of the vast experiences of free Black people in the wider Georgetown, D.C. area, especially in terms of how these men were being racialized and dehumanized in relation to the exploitation of their labor. Now, in terms of our methodology, we started by collecting data from the original source um, and then organizing it in a digital platform. In our case, we used Google Sheets spreadsheets. Um, so using the daybook, we first constructed a rough draft of the data set um, to comprehend the transcription um, and to analyze it. And many of us started to use the info that was already present that you can see here on the screen. Um, and after that initial first step, it was up to us to construct our own individual data sets. Now, since it was an individual endeavor, um, many of us decided to focus on highlighting a couple factors that stood out to us. For example, um, after learning a bit more about data collection through this program, um, I focused on different columns or adding different columns such as special markings, events such as reselling dates, and um, adding historical context. Uh, and after we shared our data sets, we began to work together to create a, a rough draft of the collaborative data set. Um, but before we began adding any new categories, we made sure to have a lot of productive conversations because we needed to be on the same page about um, the meaning of the source and the transcriptions. For example, we saw um, a few repeated names. Um, so Elsie, as you can see there on the screen, um, was mentioned in the patrimony list as well as a later transaction. And this raised a lot of questions about whether this was the same person or not. Um, so in addition to assuming that it was a shortened version or a spelling variation, she was also valued around the same price on the list as well as the later transaction. So we were a little bit more confident in saying that this was in fact the same person when we made the data set. Um, and after we were confident in all of these decisions and all of these conversations, we made our final data set. Now in total, we had um, 21 columns. 
Um, and if you can look a little closely at our uh, titles, we were extremely intentional. We were making sure that we were as meticulous with our data extraction as we were with our digital presentation, because we wanted to make sure that the organization of it made sense um, for public attempts to access our findings as well as our research. Uh, the next thing that we did was make a data dictionary. Um, we needed to be able to um, best explain our data and to reach wider audiences, again, for future research um, and how uh, the public was to interpret our finding as well. For example, one of our um, terms, assumed family group, we define that as family connections created using enslaved individuals, imputed gender and assumed ages. Um, so for example, within the patrimony list, we had Peter Twine aged at 45, Ellie 30, and Dinah at 12. And this was our assumption that this was one family unit as a whole. Now within the daybook, there were enslaved black community members being labeled as invalid and insane. Um, and we decided to have that be one of our research focuses. Uh, we utilized disability enslaved scholarship from authors such as Dana Remy Berry, Pierre W. Orleus, and many others. Um, now, in terms of um, terms, insanity could in many instances be likely attributed to the mental anguish and the psychological trauma of families forced to relocation. Um, in addition, enslavers labeled insane people as invalid when they were uh, deemed unequipped, such as the elderly, children, um, people with multiple physical constraints, such as blindness. Um, others were labeled insane for what many enslavers called deviant behaviors, such as uh, refusing to show up for work, frequently running away, and possessing their own autonomy. Now, the categorization of invalid and insane was created by white enslavers based on similar notions that, for one, enslaved Black community members were mentally and physically predisposed to the conditions of child slavery. Um, two, gendered expectations of Black exploited labor uh, were explicitly connected to how they were being labeled for their inability to comply with their assumed roles within the slave system. Um, and though they were without economic value, disabled Black bodies remained a social commodity uh, to not only maintain the slave system, but to benefit the enslaved through ens what enslavers deemed character development. Now, since our other focus was assumed family units and their bonds to one another, um, we assumed that we might find evidence of the same people from our original source in other documents. Um, the document that you see here on the screen is from page 11 of an inventory list of enslaved Black families that were bound by John Park Custis uh, in King William County, Virginia in 1782. So this was 14 years before his death. Um, now, looking closely in the red, you can see some of the names from our first assumed family, Bob, Will, and Sal. Uh, we assume, or we went off the assumption that Sal at this time may have been pregnant with Kate um, when this was being detailed, since Kate was 14 years old in 1796 uh, patrimony list. Now, overall, this research largely speaks to the fact that, for one, based on the um, provided data in the patrimony list and the inventory list, Bob and Sal may have created a family within the brutality of their perpetual enslavement and had a life together for 14 years or more. Um, and like many other assumed family units we uncovered, they were separated and sold away from one another to enslavers who are virtually unknown to us today. And by the time they were being ripped apart in 1796, both 36-year-old Sal and 7-year-old George were being labeled as invalid and insane. The implications of these findings have a large impact on how the slave system disabled Black people and broke families apart. Now, traditional knowledge collection methods are seldom able to retrieve personal histories of enslaved Black people. The occlusion of enslaved Black people's resistance and basic biographical information from the dominant narrative impacts, for one, contemporary Black people's political awareness and identity formation, um, for two, Black reclamation and community healing practices, and finally, people's understanding of enslavement in general, as U.S. enslavement was a death-dealing institution that was that commodified, regulated, and disabled Black bodies while also separating Black families. In an effort to forge a pro-people's intellectual course, our research findings points towards subversive historiography as a justice-oriented intellectual practice. The high-capacity alternative intellectual frameworks have for reproducing reparative archival and genealogical work, the importance of interdisciplinary and confrontational scholarship, 
as through our merging of Black studies, disability studies, slavery studies, and the Black digital humanities, we have broadened the horizons of what can be uncovered about enslaved people. Our research proves that reconceptualizing dispossession, commodification, and labor exploitation as a disabling process adds a much needed dimension to the mainstream understanding of enslavement. In today's political climate, history is constantly being erased and altered into a whitewashed version of itself. In 2023, it was announced by the governor of Florida, Ron DeSantis, that the new public school system would argue that enslavement benefited enslaved people as well as their descendants. This reflection of the national and global future of historical analysis further proves that true history must prevail as falsehoods are increasingly common. Our soon to be published data article attempts to recenter the true and untold narratives of enslaved and disabled enslaved lives and how forced familial separation plays a catastrophic part in the lives of the enslaved and their descendants who must reimagine healing and community in the present. It's important to remember that our scholarly contributions serve as intellectual frameworks for the praxis we want everyone to engage in, not just theoretical revisions. More projective and tangible actions like the ones you see on my last one on the screen are born from the intellectual discipline that aims to push for community collaboration and to share the unflinching truth about our realities. Thank you. Okay, hi, I'm Victoriana Mejia. I'm a recent graduate from St. Mary's University it was in public history and international global relations. Um, I did enslaved.org last summer with Cam actually. And um, hi, my name is Jaden Evans. I am a current undergrad student at St. Mary's University majoring in uh, public history and I'm minoring in international global studies. Uh, this project that we'll be talking about today is only a sliver of the history of slavery in Texas that is being told. Me, Tori, and our fellow cohort team are honored to talk about our uh, research and what we found and how we can contribute to it today. Firstly, I would like to discuss the concept of space versus place and why that is important. Space and place can hold different meanings to different people. While these two concepts can often be intertwined, they are distinct in many ways. I actually have a question for the audience. Uh, does anyone remember the Alamo? Raise your hand if you do. Okay. Do you remember um, the history behind it that you were taught in school? Okay. Well, what if I told you that that history was has been distorted? Right. The Alamo in Texas is a, it's significant for Texas independence, but it was also a space where black and brown individuals were experiencing many different horrors, including being auctioned off. While today it remains a great deal of pride for Texas. So on the picture on the left side of the screen is the picture of the current Emily Morgan Hotel. It is adjacent to the Alamo and the Alamo is actually right. Um, it's right next to it. And this hotel was named after an enslaved um, woman, Emmeline. Um, she, in history, she was mythologized in Texas, but then she was later expelled from the state upon being a free Black person. The hotel was still named after her and was is also bearing the last name of her enslaver. 
So many of the spaces and places of slavery have been either demolished or whitewashed through their history in Texas, mm -hmm. and especially in San Antonio, like the Emily Morgan Hotel and the Alamo. And just a few streets down from the Alamo, there's another auction and holy site for enslaved men and women. The photo on the right shows the old Bear County jailhouse, commonly known then as the Bat Cave, um, due to its notorious reputation of having bats in there. Um, and the city courthouse is adjacent to it. It was in the flight to freedom, a uh, term coined by Dr. Maria Hammock, um, where freedom fighters were apprehended um, on their trek to Mexico and were forced um, into the city, into the San Antonio City Jailhouse. There were notices that there were, um, they would place notices um, that were advertised um, of their apprehension, calling for their enslaver to pay um, a fine to get them released or to face them being auctioned off again. Okay, so Bear County back in 1850 was gigantic. So present day, it would be about 52 counties within Texas. We don't have a map of Bear County from 1850 because as we know, a lot of documents have already been destroyed. It's very hard to preserve them. And they either just either get destroyed by nature or political reasons. So this is Bear County and the Alamo is located, I'm gonna walk right here, right in the middle of the city of San Antonio. So downtown San Antonio. We just wanna make sure that it is relevant and you guys know exactly what we're talking about. So when we were doing our research, we started doing our research with um, the bills of sale within San Antonio archives. So Ed Johnson was one of the researchers that started doing and like transcribing a lot of the bills of sale. And he allowed us to go through his research and allowed us to like see some of his transcriptions. The one of the names that popped up, her name was Mary Ann. And so this is a bill of sale that showed that she was um, used as a, a present or a wedding gift, or what I conjecture is a wedding gift. But what we were able to find from her past is that she came up as um, from Louisiana, brought into Galveston. From Galveston, she was transferred into San Antonio. And then in her also her age varies back and forth. Like we have her name with... 18 years old, 19 years old, and then back down to 15. So her age varies. We're not exactly sure if she's able to be found afterwards, especially since a lot of the people who were brought into Texas, they are lost. They Once they arrive into Texas, they're not documented anymore unless they are part of bills of sale or estate records. This is a an example of a ship manifest that would have the name and this would be the last tracking of a person that would be brought into Texas. So Mary Ann would have one that would be similar to this and this would have been in from Galveston and then probably no more traces of her. Uh, there are two other individuals that are associated with Mary Ann. Their names were Titus and Andrew, both around 30 years old. And they were presented as gifts to Zink's wife, Elizabeth Zink, along with Mary Ann. And while well, Tori said before that her conjecture was that they were wedding gifts, um, I can, can conjecture that Mary Ann, Titus, and Andrew um, were given, Zink gave them to his wife in order to invade his creditors. And it's later that Mary Ann was sold to pay off her creditors as collateral. Um, I, actually, she was. Um, this was done on the courthouse steps. <laughs> oh, this information is based off a transcription of a written exchange between the enslavers. Interestingly, like as Tori mentioned before, uh, Mary Ann's age varied in these exchanges. Initially recorded her as 19, then as 18, and then on to 15. There's no certainty to her age, which is something that is quite common. But we still know it's her because of her ins um, enslaver. So as we have seen with even the previous enslaved.org um, cohorts, tracing ancestry is very difficult. We have seen it in many other aspects as well. So one of the ones that we had found, her name was Sherry. Um, we're not sure if it was Cherry, Sherry, Cheryl, if it was French, but her name varies. And so we cannot exactly 
like pinpoint because there's a lot of contradictions if it is her. Um, a lot of other documents that once she would have been freed, she would have been either located in Houston or Dallas, but we're, again, we're not sure. A lot of the records that we do have now, present day, have not been, tra been transcribed. They are either losing, um, they're being lost like water damage, or again, they're just being thrown away. And so a lot of the documents that we have been going through, um, we're kind of asking the public to help us because the transcriptions have been lost. <laughs> Which is why when doing this research, we strive to continue working by um, working on it by adopting ethical historiography and as a justice oriented practice that embraces minority voices at the center stage. Understanding the foundation of which archival research can provide a reparative ar um, archival and genealogical work, advocating for museum decolonization movements, dissident works, and critical ethics studies. We are highlighting the importance of archival restorations, as well as the need for a confrontational scholarship within difficult conversations. So just like our previous uh, presentation from, because I was again with it, I have continued the same type of practices. And so with insight.org, we also built another data set, which will be also uh, accessible later with that contains like bill of cells, which has their given names, their personal um, identification number. So other people can later track who they are. The reason why we're also doing this is because we are trying to give them back personhood. A lot of these people have been lost. They lost their identity. And without the help from the community and because like previous um, presentations, uh, we need help asking from the public, from the addicts, the basements and such. And we would like to um, acknowledge slavevoyages.org, St. Mary's University, the San Antonio Public Library, um, the Bear County Archives, um, enslaved.org, the University of Maryland, the San Antonio African American Community Archive and Museum, um, archivist Heather Ballinger, um, Dr. Dominguez with Rice University, as well as Maria, Dr. Marie Hammack from Ohio, Ohio State University, uh, whose research um, also on the history of, slave, history of slavery in Texas has helped um, collaborate with our research and the broader impact of sharing lost voices. Thank you everyone for your attention. Um, at this time, I'd like to uh, encourage you to visit the enslaved.org site to see what data sets and other resources might be of interest to you uh, to speak with me or with Dr. Um, Daryl Williams, who is the co-director of the enslaved.org project um, in the back, if you would like to collaborate or publish with the enslaved.org project anyway. Um, but most importantly, to invite you to ask um, questions of the researchers here before us about the work that they've shared here today. Thank you. I have one question in reference to the um, in reference to the um, data books or the daily books, was that a requirement of the individuals just keep those daily books of what they did with enslaved persons? The day book. Day book, yeah. yeah. Just to confirm, are you asking um, if it was a requirement for the enslavers to keep a day book of their transactions? Right. Um, I'm not going to say it was a requirement. Yeah, I think that was like a family choice. Um, I'm going to work off of the like the assumption that they had a lot of uh, properties and possessions and assets and things like that. Um, so a day book was more for like organization purposes, tracking transactions, because, um, you know, there were a lot of pages in that day book that were specifically for transactions. Um, so yeah, I'm going to say it was speaking to the organization and the, the bounds of wealth that they had that they needed to uh, keep yes, track of. Individuals. Especially yes. individuals, yes. Thank you.
And I'll just add, I didn't talk about day books, but um, I found one in the home of a, dis of a descendant. And so they aren't only kept by enslavers. So um, free African-Americans who own land and who were farmers, they also kept them too, as a business record to keep track of your yes. transactions. Thank you. As I walk over here, walk over here and think about that day book, as Cam mentioned, is small enough that it would be probably on Thomas Peter's person as he's moving around as well. So he's keeping sort of, you know, shorthand notes, including with the economic transactions. Thank you. I've never been told I was quiet. Um, Ms. Bell, you mentioned an article you were, I think you were writing white, right after you talked about whitewashing, whitewashing. Can I get the name of the article and when it's going to be published, where I could find it? Yeah. I'm going to get that to our, okay. our editor. <laughs> so this particular article will be published on March 31st, <laughs> um, as that is a publication deadline for Volume 5, Issue 1 of the Journal of Slavery and Data Preservation. Um, but all of the presentations that you have heard from today either have already had a data set published about them or will have one um, on the Journal of Slavery and Data Preservation's website, which you can find through the enslaved.org link. Thank you. What's that? Wow. <laughs> Gotta keep my day job. <laughs> speak okay, speak. Yeah. Well, actually, we have really, we've got some people live streaming as well. So. Oh. Hi, I'm Camilla Cody. I loved all your presentations and I'm going to stalk you in a bit, um, but I wanted to ask Grace, loved your presentation and you talked about how you, uh, my question is, were there not account books or estate books that could show like the other side? Probably not, but I was just very interested because I, um, about the hiring out. So are there not um, accounts that show the outgoing payments, like the, the so the compensation. We talked about the compensation. Are there no accounts from the people that paid that? Very vague question. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, so we got that document from the Riversdale House Archives. So they only have that document, um, and then the individual um hirers those would all be probably if they had those um documents if they kept those um they would probably be um just because they were not as wealthy uh landowners as um the Crampins and the Calverts they would probably be in like attics and basements if they exist yeah. Um, wonderful session. I really enjoyed all of your presentations. Um, uh, my question was for Dr. Sutton. I'm really looking forward to your book. Um, and my question was if you could talk about what it was like going into these descendant communities, how you made the connections that you made. I'm interested in doing descendant work for my own research um, and would just love to know how you made the connections and talk to people and convince people to share such vulnerable stories with you. Thank you. Um, so I started this work as a PhD student, and I have been doing it for a couple of years, going mainly to historical societies. So when you're doing a county history, a local history of this kind, you're often told the first place and kind of like the, the first place you go to is to the historical societies. Once I realized that there was not much in there about Black women, um, I went to Google. Um, I Google the Greenville Settlement, and instantly newspaper articles across the decades popped up about descended communities. I just so happened to find one on Facebook, and it's kind of like to a circle that um, I end up making arguments about descendant Facebook pages as archives mm -hmm. and gateways to broader discovery. To, to broader discovery, and so I started on Facebook and I reached out to the individual. And what I've learned is a lot of these communities, if they're if they trust the work that you're doing, they are happy yeah. to share their stories. Mm -hmm. And so many people want their stories told, but they have a distrust in institutions. Yeah. And I also will say that I don't think someone who did not present them, did not walk into the space looking like me, um, 
would have had the same exact experience that I had that I had. And so I reached out on Facebook and they invited me to their annual homecoming. And annual homecomings became important to how I understand black women's roles in preserving um or keeping their ancestral history. And so I went to the homecoming and I realized that families, because this this in the community is is various families that came from this free black farming community. Um, they all came back annually. And at this point, I think I may have been like my fourth year of my PhD program, and I was still trying to write a dissertation on Black women with very few sources that had their words or mentioned them directly. So I was doing a lot of um, informed speculation. And so um, I thought the homecoming would be a good idea to do a history harvest. And I had just started to learn about what a history harvest was because Indiana University had deal one on campus. And so I went to their next homecoming, brought in scanners and a phone. This is what you call minimal computing in, in DH, where you don't got to have a lot of skills to do anything. Uh -huh. We had a phone, we had an iPad and scanners. We scanned their documents, um, recorded their oral, their oral histories, and that became one of my primary source bases for my dissertation. And at the same time, I started to make the argument that the sources that I'm finding in these descendant homes are just as valuable as the ones that are in institutions. And I also started to learn about why certain documents do not show up in institutions, or the fact that there might be certain documents in institutions, but the way that they're described, backlogs, cataloged, you don't even know that they're there. And so, um, the original question was about building a relationship with the communities. I think that that depends on the individual, but I feel like if you go into it with good intentions, that they're accepting. And this is one thing that I told somebody that I met earlier, when you have um, run into the issue of people not wanting to share their oral histories. My interest was not only, my interest was more so in the documents. And sometimes people are more open to sharing their family documents once you've told them, because sometimes people don't feel like what they have is valuable. And I talk about the family Bibles and my grandmother has her mother's. And when I asked her about it, and I usually include this in my presentation before a lifetime I didn't, um, I asked her about it. She said, what you want with that old raggedy Bible? And I'm like, Grandma, that's the Black Archive. <laughs> um, and so some people don't understand the value that what they have in their homes has um, outside of their family and their memories and connections to it. And so just having conversations with them. But the point that I was making is sometimes if you ask for documents or other ways to learn about their history, they might be more open. But it really does require building a relationship with individuals. I mentioned this earlier, and I'm talking way too much, so I'm going to try to end this right now. But um, it was mutually beneficial. Like when I found things or wrote about their great-great-grandparents, I shared that information with them. A lot of it was collaborative. When I say that they would go to libraries in their local communities and send me things, and that's why I felt like I had to name this, because this is not the methodology that we are taught as graduate students studying slavery. Many of us don't even work with descendant communities, but it was a, it's the descendant communities that make this work possible. And nobody studying the Black experience in the rural Midwest during the antebellum period can write a complete history of Black people without the records of their des descendants. It's just not possible. It might be in other regions, but that's not the case for the rural Midwest. I think the perfect. So I asked Tori, you know, Tori, you um, have been in um, the role of teaching some of the things that you learned at enslaved.org and, and the student summer research opportunity program, and then teaching it to a next generation to appear. Could you share with us a little bit about what you've learned from a methodological perspective yourself, but also how you have to then pass it on to next generations or next class cohorts. So over the summer, uh, like what Tan said, there was a lot of uh, difficult conversations. We had to work with each other with empathy, with grace, with a lot of just accepting a lot of the work that we were going to be doing. It could be a very triggering to others. And so we had the conversations. We knew that we wanted to be intentional with what words we were going to be using within our, like, our data set, within our article, because at the end of the day, while this is important work to us, we don't know who's going to come across our data set. We don't know if it's going to be a descendant that's going to see it and be like, oh, well, they're just written down as a number, but because they're more than a number, they're a person. 
And so when I finished over the summer, I was very much still inspired to continue on researching enslaved people, but within Texas, because I, as a student in Texas in public schools, we're not taught over slavery. We're taught that Texas wasn't a civil war, but in the sense of to get away from the United States. I didn't know that Texas was had as many enslaved people as they did. And that's very sad to say that I didn't learn that until I was at a university. And so when I got to St. Mary's, um, I started learning this, started do re doing more research, and then enslaved.org completely opened my eyes and I wanted to bring it back. And so therefore, Jaden and I got together to create our own cohort with other students and other researchers throughout the United States from, again, Heather Bollinger, who is an archivist here in the East Coast. And then we also worked with Dr. Uh, Domica Silvia, which is from Rice University. We spoke to uh, Dr. Maria Hammock from Ohio State University. And so we worked, we tried to build a community together. We try to build a community of accepting empathy, of trying to be inclusive as we possibly could. And we have been trying to find these people because they are there, but they're not any other records of them besides in a bill of cell, besides in estate records. And a lot of that has not been tra transcribed. And thankfully, because of the Bear County archives, there are a couple of people there that are slowly transcribing and slowly uploading them online. However, it's not a lot of people doing it, and it's been very difficult to transcribe them by ourselves because these books, the records, they are big books. They are double lettered back and front, and it's old handwriting, and if you're not like really versed in reading cursive, yeah, it, it can get a little difficult, and so it... Sometimes you read it's really tedious. Yes, it does get tedious. And recently, I actually had eye surgery. And so looking at these documents, I was like, I can't do this right now. And so it gets, it gets tedious. It gets exhausting. And so that is part of our research of, like, we're giving back to the community. We're trying to regain, like, some type of personhood for these people and ask others to help us because they're there. They deserve their place within history. They deserve to have their name known. They deserve their own little landmarks and how we we come across them in every day without knowing. And so, yeah. <laughs> yeah I'm Dr. Collins. Okay, yes. How long have you been uh, practicing digital, digitally informed labor today? One year? Um, not even one not year. year. <laughs> no. Where are you right now? If you're still the last question, share with us a little bit of what you think about what is the power, what is the role of data in understanding why it's being enslaved? Um, I mean, like Tori said before, like going to public school in Texas, like you never learned about the history of um slavery in Texas, and like you glance brief, brief um glance over Texas' role in the Civil War, and you know being black myself like it's kind of hard to be in a state where they won't acknowledge that your people were there like my um I'm part of um my ancestors are like one of the first uh, black cowboys on the uh, east side of Texas and no one really acknowledges that you know they're there like we have land that we held there for generations and so in doing this I want to uh, help people who also like want to know their history and where they came from and um, give back personhood to um, the names that have been lost and um, help like also rewrite the stories like the story of, of Emily Morgan um, how she was considered a traitor because um, she um, was taken over to Senate on the side and then after uh, after the war she was um, tossed out of Texas. And you know her story in uh, Texas is super um, mythologized, and then uh, she's seen as a traitor, but that's not her true story. So it's very important um, that we continue this data set because ultimately we're going to come across a lot of stories like this, and so we need to retell their stories as well. I want to thank you all for joining us. Thank our.